And we use our tongues as weapons to cut people up. What happens? Those wars create fallout. Explosions create fallout. And that fallout, that toxic debris, contaminates every area of our life. What we do and who we are. We're moving verse by verse through the book of James. So if you're here for the first time and you hear a message on this topic, I don't want you to think, well, he's addressing a problem in the church. No, James was addressing a problem in the church, but it's one that is still worth talking about and worth allowing God's word to shine a light on. Father, thank you for your word. We need to hear from you. Speak to us in these moments. In Jesus' name, amen. James chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Now, we covered verse 5 a little bit last week, and I'll explain that, but I want to include it. And uh, I want to sharpen our focus on verse 6. The word of the Lord reads, So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Now, as you noticed, James spends a lot of time talking about the tongue. We have been dealing with it for a couple of Sundays, and we still have a a little bit more material to cover as we deal with the first half of chapter 3. And you're thinking to yourself, why? Why does he do that? I mean, isn't he, isn't he writing to church members? So is he preaching to the choir? Do we need this? We do. We do. You probably heard the story. It's, it's an old one about a preacher who was riding his bicycle in a small town going from house to house, everybody lived close together, just visiting the members, making his calls. And he saw a little boy who was by the side of the road and he was selling his lawnmower. And so the pastor pulled over and visited with him and he said, after he looked at it, how much you want for that lawnmower? And the little boy said, well, really, I don't care. He said, I just want enough to go buy me a bicycle. And uh, Pastor looked at it and he said, well, let me ask you something. Would you take my bicycle and trade for that lawnmower? And the little boy kind of looked it over. He said, would you let me ride it? And so he let him ride a little bit. And the pastor looked over that lawnmower. And the boy came back and he said, sir, you got yourself a deal. And the pastor went over and pulled on the cord and tried to just start up the lawnmower. But it wouldn't start. He kept pulling and it wouldn't start. And he said to the young boy, hey, something's wrong with this lawnmower. It won't start. And he said, I forgot to tell you, you've got to cuss at it in order for it to start. <laughs> and uh, the pastor said, young man, I'm a, I'm a minister. He said, uh, I've been saved so long, I don't even remember the words. And the uh, little boy said, you just keep pulling on the cord. They'll come back to you. <laughs> It doesn't take much for it to come back to us. Yes, he's preaching to the choir, but we need to hear what he has to say. Why? Well, I like what Eugene Peterson says. He writes, Christian churches are not, as a rule, model communities of good behavior. Let's be honest. They are rather places where human misbehavior is brought out into the open, faced, and dealt with. The letter of James, he writes, shows one of the church's early pastors skillfully going about his work of confronting, diagnosing, and dealing with areas of misbelief and misbehavior that had turned up in congregations that were committed to his care. So we need to hear this. Now, as we break down verse 6 of our text, I want you to uh, think about the fact that verse 5 sets it up beautifully. In fact, Verse 5, the first half belongs with the previous two verses where it talks about something of disproportionate size doing a lot of damage, exerting a lot of power, a bit in the mouth of a horse, 
a rudder in the hands of the captain of a ship, and a small spark or ember or even a match can do great damage, can cause a fire. But then as we continue on in verse 5, we see it set up the rest of verse 6, almost like a bridge where we go from talking about the power of the tongue in a neutral way, not really good or bad, just it is powerful, to talking about the tongue as that flamethrower in our mouth in verse 6 that can do incredible damage to so many people. David Platt puts it like this, no one part of us is, a more slip, is in a more slippery place than the tongue. Now listen to this, I think that's why God has given us teeth and a mouth. Teeth to cage in that deadly weapon and a mouth to close it in. Have you ever had to just close your mouth and keep it closed? Have you ever had to bite your tongue? Now it's rare that I, I use another writer's outline, but when someone says what you want to say, it's probably good to just let them say it. So the, the scaffolding or the skeletal outline of this message, the four main points, I, I borrowed from jo John Blanchard's book, Truth for Life. And, I want to just quickly go through them. As we look at the text, we see, first of all, the suggestion of potential. The verse says, the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is a fire. He's used similes before. It is like a bit in the mouth of a horse. It is like the rudder of a ship. But now he is saying, metaphorically, it is a fire. A fire, and even mixes his metaphors because he says it is a fire, and then it is a world of iniquity. Within us, a world of iniquity. One writer said it's like we have an ecosystem of evil within our own mouth. According to Sam Alberry, the tongue is a world in itself. Continents of wickedness, vast uncharted interiors of any numbers of evils. Sometimes we'll say something and we'll say, I didn't even know I had that in me. How could I say such a thing? He writes, the potential for any number of world-changing horrors lies right in your mouth. No wonder, John Calvin wrote, a slender portion of flesh contains in it the whole world of iniquity. I love the book of Proverbs, and Proverbs is to the Old Testament what James is to the New Testament. But if you read the book of Proverbs, you won't read any dire warnings about the use and the misuse of your elbow. There are no verses that warn you about the perils of not controlling your big toe. But listen to Proverbs 16, 27. In the English Standard Version, it reads, A worthless man plots evil, and his speech is like a scorching fire. Proverbs 26, 21 in the voice reads, Like charcoal to smoldering embers and dry wood to a fire, so a hot-tempered man kindles strife. He talked about the suggestion of its potential. The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. But then, then he turns his attention to a second characteristic. The stain of pollution. Verse 6 says, staining the whole body. Staining the whole body. Paul Cedar writes, as a world of iniquity, the tongue cannot be held in isolation. It corrupts the entire body. Grant Osborne goes even further. And he talks about the fact that it corrupts individually and corporately. It corrupts physically and spiritually. He talks about the fact that holding anger in can cause acidic problems with your stomach. And it can cause acidic problems in the congregation as it goes from pew to pew. Because it corrupts, he says, it defiles, it stains. In fact, chapter 1, verse 27 uses the same word where it says, Pure religion and undefiled before God is this, to visit the fathers and the widowless and the widows and their affliction. The fatherless and the widows and their affliction. And then it says, and to keep oneself from being polluted, stained, corrupted by the world. Now let's be honest. There's some strong language here directed toward the sins of the tongue. And we don't usually talk about it that way. Not in church. In fact, most of the time, that's why people think something's wrong when you do address the issue. Because gossip, innuendo, criticism, slander, even 
character assassination are often viewed as what I would call acceptable sins in the church. Why? Because we enjoy them so much. I remember a time coming up in church when everything was sinful. You couldn't do anything. You know what I'm talking about. We can't go there because that's sinful. We can't do that because that's sinful, but we could gossip and we could talk about people. We've all met church members with what someone described as a great sense of rumor. You know, you can sin with your mouth, you can gossip, you can lie, and yet you can walk in proudly on Sunday morning into the church and be fully welcomed. In fact, church is often a popular place to practice this, this sin. Why is that? I read an article last week from the Evangelical Press Association's website that talked about a language we call Christianese. It's where we, in our Christian subculture, describe things a certain way and other people would have no idea what we mean. It's like when you knock on somebody's door and you're witnessing to them and you say, I want you to be saved by the blood of the Lamb. And they have no idea what you're talking about, but it sounds scary. We use language that is clearly understandable to us and don't even know we're bilingual, but we speak Christianese. And so on this website, they offered these words that we use, these phrases that we use, and then they offered the everyday translation of what it really means. Christianese, if it be God's will. We say that a lot, right? Translation, I really don't think God is going to answer this one. Christianese, let's have a word of prayer. Translation, I'm going to pray for a long, long, long time. Christianese, that's not my spiritual gift. Translation, find someone else. <laughs> Christianese, fellowship. Translation, organize gluttony. Christianese, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Translation, I'm totally clueless. Christianese, Lord willing, Lord willing. Translation, you may think I'll be there, but I won't. <laughs> Christianese, I don't feel led. Translation, you can't make me. <laughs> Christianese, God led me to do something else. Translation, I slept in instead of going to church. <laughs> Christianese, she has such a sweet spirit. Translation, what an airhead. <laughs> Christianese, I have a check in my spirit about him. Translation, I can't stand that jerk. <laughs> Christianese, I'll be praying for you. Translation, there's an outside chance I'll remember this conversation later today. <laughs> Christianese, in conclusion. Translation, I'll be done in another hour or so. <laughs> Christianese, let us pray. Translation, I'm going to pretend to talk to God now, but I'm really preaching at you. Christianese, you have to just put it in God's hands. Translation, don't expect me to help you. <laughs> Christianese, God wants to prosper you. Translation, give me all your money. And notice this one. Christianese, prayer concerns. Prayer concerns. Translation, gossip. There's a book called Stains on Glass Windows, and Ken Anderson shares these poetic lines in there. I heard it from a trusted source, so there's no cause to doubt it. And only tell it now, of course, so you can pray about it. We protect certain sins, but they still do damage. They still create a stain on us and corrupt and defile. The Bible says staining the whole body. But then the third point he makes is this, the sphere of its penetration. The text says setting on fire the entire course of life. Setting on fire the entire course of our existence. In the communicator's commentary, we read this, the tongue does not merely affect the physical body of a person, it brings corruption to the total life. It affects not only, listen, it affects not only what we do, but what we are. The tongue affects what we do and what we are. I thought about it this week, and I wrote this down. At the Tower of Babel, God frustrated the egotistical efforts of some proud, rebellious people by giving them different languages and scattering them all over the earth. It was a miracle of tongues affecting what they did 
and who they were. On the day of Pentecost, God honored the prayers of some desperate, obedient disciples and blessed them with different languages and sent them all over the world, a miracle of tongues impacting what they did and who they were. In Isaiah 6, an angel took a burning coal from the altar of God and touched the prophet's lips with it. What did it symbolize? His calling and his cleansing. What he did and who he was. And now here in James 3, the writer describes a human tongue touched by the flames of hell, which corrupt every course of that speaker's life. Who he is and what he does. As I looked at the word words, it jumped out at me right away that that's an anagram for sword. Sword. And when we engage in word wars, and we use our tongues as weapons to cut people up, what happens? Those wars create fallout. Explosions create fallout. And that fallout, that toxic debris, contaminates every area of our life. What we do and who we are. And then following that look into the sphere of penetration, how it affects every area of our life and the contamination and corruption, he makes one final point in verse 6. He talks about the source of its power. Verse 6 says, and it's set on fire by hell. Three things about the text I want to mention quickly. First of all, James uses the present participle at the end of verse 6. So it really could be translated this way. It continually is set on fire by hell. Continually. It's an ongoing present reality. And when he uses that word hell, he uses the word Gehenna. It's the same word his brother Jesus used when he spoke of hell. What was Gehenna? Well, it was immediately recognizable to his audience because it was a trash dump just outside the city gates of Jerusalem. And 24-7, there was a fire smoldering and stinking as people put their trash and their refuse in this place. And Jesus, looking at that trash dump, that smoldering place of stench, thought it was a great visual for what hell would be like. A hell that was described in Mark 9, 48 with these words. They're the worms that eat them never die. And the fire that burns them is never put out. Last Sunday night we got home and I opened the refrigerator. And have you ever opened the refrigerator and something's bad in there? <laughs> Something stinks in there. And we were like, well, what could it be? What could it be? Everything's in those little Tupperware things or the, the uh, descendants of the Tupperware things, whatever they are. And it's all wrapped up real good. And so we looked and looked. And Susie started pulling stuff out. And finally she opened this one thing. And it was like, whoo! <laughs> That's it. And I, I knew it was horrible for her to do that. But, but I still had to smell it. You know what I'm saying? You have to. <laughs> and so I was like, oh man, you're right. It was sour cream. And I said, what happens to sour cream when it goes bad? Does it get sour? I mean... <laughs> It was already sour. But she put it in the trash bag and she said, would you take that trash bag out now? I said, I will take it out now and I will put it in the garbage can outside right now. It stinks so bad. He talked about a place of fire and a place of stench. And as I thought about that, I thought about the word for bad breath, halitosis. But if our breath is... Like that city dump, it, it really almost would be what I, 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 I call helitosis. And I, I made up the word, so I made up a definition. Helitosis, when your breath gives off a putrid yet smoky aroma that might put one in mind of a person eating trash and then washing it down with water from the lake of fire. This is the spiritual smell of a James 3.6 mouth. That's extreme, Pastor. Well, listen, listen to... Our text, as it's paraphrased in the word on the street, paraphrase. James 3, 5, and 6. Even the biggest mouth is only small compared to the rest of the body. But it's got big ideas about itself. It takes only one match to burn a thousand trees and one mouth sets, 
seems to be a bit of an arsonist. One mouth seems to be a bit of an arsonist. Verse 6, this pyromaniac part of your body is up for burning more than your fingers. It is a lighter fueled by hell's own white spirit bent on destruction. This week I, I just started writing some things that I didn't even know I would, if I would put in the message because I wrote it in my journal. I just want to share with you some memories that I wrote down. When I was a boy, if someone lit you up with their words, there would always be another kid close by who assumed it was their duty to pronounce the obligatory. How many remember this? Ooh, burn. <laughs> remember that? Ooh, burn. Through the years, I've watched many of those individuals, we'll call them Bernies or Bernadettes, grow up to be passive pyromaniacs who don't necessarily set the fires of slander or rumor or gossip, but they love to watch them burn. Apparently, these folks think gossip, gossip can be divided into portions so that one can enjoy just a sip of that cancerous cocktail. When they tell you, sure, I listen to gossip, but I don't really pay any attention. Can't you just hear a politician somewhere saying, yeah, I smoke, but I didn't inhale. <laughs> I remember something that happened many years ago during a Wednesday night Bible study. I was pastoring a small congregation, and our midweek attendance was even smaller. So we met in the fellowship hall. On that particular evening, I was teaching on this very subject from James 3, sinning with our words. I wasn't targeting anyone with my topic, and I didn't, I didn't call anyone out. As it turned out, I didn't have to. The Holy Spirit was at work. There was a woman there that night who was truly famous for her big mouth. In the 11 years before I became shepherd of that congregation, the church had gone through 11 pastors. Her uncontrolled tongue had undoubtedly been a big reason for the high turnover rate in leadership. So I was a little surprised when she decided to speak up that night. But I was truly shocked by what she had to say. Without a bit of shame or anything resembling a conscience, she said, I don't gossip. But if people want to tell me something, I can't stop them. I mean, just out of the blue, she had to interject that into the conversation. I don't gossip, but if people want to tell me something, I can't stop them. Ignoring the outright lie she had just told, I tried to focus on her exact words. Think about the level of rationalizing that went into this irrational argument. I don't gossip, but if people want to tell me something, I can't stop them. This moral vampire who fed off the blood and pain of others was actually casting herself as a victim. I can't help it if people want to dump gossip on me. Her comment reminds me of a couple of lines from a poem W.A. Criswell quoted in his commentary on James. Listen. But the gossipy tongue would be balked in its plan for causing heart burning and tears if it weren't helped out by the gifts misguided man who possesses two gossipy ears. Gossipy ears. Listen, I thought about what she said that night, and I thought to myself, people with garbage are looking for trash cans. And if you've got one on either side of your head, they can see them and they can smell them. The person who practices what James is describing here is not like a Jeremiah with fire shut up in his bones. He is like a Lucifer with fire released through his tongue and his words. One commentator put it like this, in the search for weapons of mass destruction, we really only need to look in a mirror and open our mouth. David Gibson in the book Radically Whole wrote about a woman who committed suicide in Los Angeles, California, and she left a note, a note that had only two words. They said. They said. When I read that, I thought about a book that I rescued years ago. I shared the story with you. They were going to throw it away. I was at college and had this big table of free books, and so I went through there. I found a autographed copy of a, a book by a pastor from many years ago named John W. Holland. 
And there was a, a poem in there that stays with me to this day called A Song of the Gossips. It goes like this. There is a land called They Say, and it's so far away. Though none have ever seen it, we hear it every day. Discoverers have traveled to farthest stretch of sun, yet seem no nearer to it than when their search begun. The sun shines not in, they say, it's twilight all the while. The people have dim eyesight, so never greet or smile. They talk about the neighbors, they break each other's hearts. They carry bows and arrows and all shoot poison darts. The imps that swarm from they say will never fight you fair. For when backed into a corner, they vanish in thin air. But when their country's charted, I think that, they, that we can tell that they say land lies very near the borderline of hell. Would you bow your head with me? As I preach to the choir, what James, the pastor, wrote to his congregants scattered abroad. I want to cause you and cause myself to again be aware of the potential in our mouth to share the message. As the ensemble saying, I'm going to keep on singing. I'm going to keep on shouting. I'm going to keep on lifting my voice and let the world know Jesus saves the good that we can do with our words. But we have to be aware of that deadly, deadly fire that can be loosed. That weapon of mass destruction that can cause so much damage. I want you to search your heart right now. And I want you to pray a prayer with me from Romans chapter 12. Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, which literally means your spiritual act of worship. And be not conformed, or so that you won't be conformed to this present world, but you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I want to lead you in a prayer right now. And I want you to think about your words. Maybe think about something that was said to you that you still struggle with. It inflicted such a wound that years later the fallout is still hurting you and others. We know the damage one word can do. And I want us to pray. James is about practical Christianity, written to Christians. And we need to hear this. I remember years ago when things got so bad that the award ceremonies and that live performance created such a risk. This was before they were just totally useless like they are now. That they implemented a five second delay so that they might have time to edit if somebody said something that didn't need to go out on the air and be broadcast to the whole world. I think we need to ask God to give us a five second delay, a spiritual sensitivity, a filter that says, let the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O oh God, my strength and my redeemer. Does it edify? Does it uplift? Is it true? Is it loving? I'm going to pray this prayer, and I just want you to make it your own. Pray it with me. Just speak it out loud. Heavenly Father, I present myself, all of me, as a living sacrifice. 
Make me holy and acceptable to you. This is my spiritual act of worship. Help me to not be conformed to this present world. The way it thinks, the way it speaks, the way it behaves. But help me to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. Because I know that from the abundance of my mind, my heart, the mouth speaks. Sanctify me, Lord, as I present myself to you. And let the Holy Spirit of God take a coal from the altar. And spiritually, Lord, touch my mouth so that it is clean. And I remember that I am called to live like a child of God. In Christ's name, amen. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you. I thank you. James was not talking about a sinless perfectionism here on earth. We won't achieve that. We will continue to need to kneel and pray and repent. But Lord, our direction is growing stronger in you. We don't live a lifestyle, Lord, where we argue I have free speech. I can say whatever I want to. We realize that as a child of God, we are not our own. We are bought at a price and therefore we glorify God in our bodies and in our mouths, which belong to God. We are to have spirit controlled speech. Help us this week to experience that as every day, every day, we remember that we are not a dead sacrifice, but a living sacrifice. And we are being transformed, being made new in the image of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. We are so glad that you were here today with us to worship. I pray that something that you heard today will go with you this week. And remember that God loves you and we do too.